So, uh, would like to introduce Colette as well. You might be a little bit surprised uh, by her, but first of all, I think we need to have more women on stage. Uh, secondly, uh, Colette has been uh, is representing an area which is key, uh, specifically not just to produce things and to do things, but as well to communicate. And she has been uh, the key person in introducing the Toyota Prius in California. And that's why I asked her as well for fresh view from the outside as well to participate in the discussion. Okay. Good. I may not need this. Um, <laughs> Shout it out. So, um, for method and um, for Avita, and quite uh, certainly for um, Tesla and for ICO as well, uh, you're forging um, new frontiers in terms of technical improvements in products that we use every day. Um, and I'm wondering where within your own um, within your own families you feel the um, the line is between open sourcing your um, discoveries in terms of new ways to do things and what you consider to be um, you need to keep it in house at your proprietary edge. So can you do me a favor to, to say a little bit to your background? Because you're oh, I'm one of those MBAs. I'm not all clever. <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to figure out what your business models are looking like. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first shot at that one. Um, I'll start by saying I think actually the model of protecting everything and holding the market static while you extract value for the money you've paid for that patent is antithetical to the to the sustain or to the uh, the imperative of progress on which uh, sustainability and then beyond that is, is predicated. So. Um, there, there's something that, about that that I, I don't like. Um, at Method, we kind of don't have a choice, um, which is a convenient answer for us. But uh, we don't, we, we're not big enough to go to raw material suppliers, many of them, and say, hey, we want you to create this brand new chemistry um, just for us. Because we just, we'll, we won't buy enough of it. Um, so, but what we have been able to do is we're really fast to market, and we launch really innovative products. So what's happened over the last 12 years is we've become a lightning rod for anybody who has any interesting, greener technology. They come to us first. And while they might go, you know, Proctor might eventually incorporate a similar technology, it's gonna take them three or four years to do it. Uh, we can do it in six months. And what we do then is we'll incorporate a technology like that or help joint, do a joint development agreement where we develop a technology, we'll bring it to market, and then what we know is that by the time competitors adopt those sort of things, uh, that supplier and other suppliers are going to have other new things that will be the next best thing that we need to keep technologically moving forward. And so what we've done is actually based our entire business model around being able to rapidly innovate in that way so that most stuff we don't protect. There are, of course, things that we do protect. Our bottle designs are one of them. We get knocked off all the time. Um, so there are things that you do protect, of course, but for the most part, it's about how do you uh, work with the uh, community of people doing t technological innovation so that you're the first one that gets to look at it and you're the first one to bring it to market so that you can do that again and again. I'll speak to that a little bit. Uh, there are obviously things in any consumer products brand, brand equity that they like to protect. And in ours, you know, particularly given, given the increasing competitiveness in the marketplace around natural, organic, and green, um, there are a lot of things that we're not very open on. But there are other things, such as some of our base ingredients and so forth, that are common to a wide range of products that we are open to working with others, and we even talk to Method from time to time uh, about doing so that 
in some of the actual categories of ingredients or materials where there's a lot more progress to be made uh, and where strength in numbers can drive that progress, we will also be in those conversations. Uh, I would be glad if, if the ICO people could say a little bit more about what you actually do in California. So that was just a little footnote of that. Could you add a little bit maybe from your colleagues as well in that, that we can have an idea? What are your plans for California as well? Yeah, so right now we are in, in Los Angeles uh, located. 400, uh, 400 uh, employees we have in the sorting process. Uh, we have uh, a couple of corporations with different recycling companies. Um, in, uh, in Fresno we have a, a, a recycling plant with around about 100 uh, employees. And uh, yeah, our goal is clear. When ICO is growing up step by step, uh, we want to be in every city around uh, USA. Uh, yeah, with a lot of employees, a lot of more jobs, with, uh, and uh, with a great success for the planet. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. More questions? Um, thanks everybody for being here today. It's been a real privilege to listen to you and meet most of you. Um, I had a question. If you could discuss how the Institute is helping to advance the cradle to cradle movement, kind of expand on that a little bit. So a lot of people will hear Bill or Michael and they will say, wow, I get so excited and they'll just kind of sit there sort of stunned. So certification is a path towards making all the things that they talk about happen. So if you started looking at your product and what was in it, you're just doing the cradle cradle thing. And at the same time, you're committing yourself to social fairness, clean water, renewable energy, you can start to see where that certification just hits on everything we're all worried about. You know, we're worried about global warming. Oh, now we just got 100 companies commit their products to credit credit certification overnight. You know, you can see how water gets cleaner and everybody gets paid a fair wage. And by the way, we figure out what's in our product and we start changing that. And that's where this innovation platform happens because we have this cradle to cradle products innovation institute. Um, and we really feel like there's a need for new materials and we want to see California trying to take the lead. And the interesting thing for me about what Stefan and his company is doing is we never have figured out some of these back end things. And we've got Mike Biddle here and he's like, all these guys, the infrastructure, getting stuff back so it doesn't end up in the landfill, the whole, you know, fitting, filling, fishing that. So I think there's a role and I'd like to see more San Francisco companies get engaged with us and We'll have some certification training this summer and we'll try to engage all of you that are here and helping bring companies together and coming up with solutions. Sure, go ahead. Well, you know, I think one of the, the real potential values of the, of the Institute is higher visibility for the concept of, you know, whether or not we're going to end up with tens of thousands of products certified or not remains to be seen. But the fact that the, the vision of cradle to cradle has more authenticity and more presence through the Institute, I think, is, is very valuable. And I think particularly in the United States where cradle to cradle is not as well known as it is in parts of Europe, uh, that's gonna be a very valuable contribution and a benefit for those of us companies who have been committed to it for a long time to get more leverage out of it, frankly, in the marketplace. Yeah, the problem is with Savita is sometimes that they're a little too successful. Mm -hmm. And so they, they do this, it work for water, for example. And I was helping with my colleagues to organize it in Hamburg and we got my, motivated a lot of colleagues as well to join that. Yeah. It was 6.6 .6 kilometers because it's the average uh, yeah, kilometer uh, distance which uh, a person in Africa has to walk for water you know, to get access to healthy drinking water in Tanzania for example yeah, but they were a little too successful after three kilometers it was heavy raining so <laughs> <laughs> to walk for water was very successful so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it,
first off, all of us are here to hopefully learn from each other. And maybe can you introduce a little bit yourself just because we Hi, I'm Arthur Young. I've been managing editor of Green Building News. I teach at Berkeley and I run a marketing services company to green companies. Um, I'm very fascinated with the concept of the transparency and security of putting the contents of a product on a chip or whatever the, the methodology gets to be on every product. And I get personally very annoyed when enviros, if I'll use that term, get accused of being uh, pie-eyed, penny waste, and uh, totally in the clouds. But I'm having a struggle in my head, knowing that um, the CIA and the NSA in the United States are hacked every day, successfully. Could be a 17-year-old in Taiwan out for fun, but successfully the two greatest security agencies in the world get hacked. So what I'm trying to think of is, if your manufacturer A, with a, a shoe of some sort, and you put your product content on a chip in a shoe, how do you protect the um, security of that to away from a less ethical shoe company that could simply go out, buy a pair of shoes, and crack your coat. I'll, I'll take a first crack at that. Um, you know, we, we put all the ingredients on our, pack, on our packaging. Um, in some categories, we're required to by law, and others we're not. Um, the, the reality is that uh, analysis techniques and separations techniques are to the point where the second we launch a product, it it's not hard to know everything that's in it already. I mean, Michael showed earlier some gas chromatographs. There are, you know, there are techniques like that and others very similar to them that are very inexpensive now. I mean, we have this equipment in our, in our offices in San Francisco where we can deconstruct a, form, a, a liquid formulation very, very easily. So I actually think that the, the important parts of uh, intellectual property no longer have to do with contents. Um, and that's why I'm a huge advocate of just extreme and radical transparency as it, as it relates to that sort of thing. Because time and time and time and time again, when people are hiding that stuff, it's not for IP reasons. It's for public relations reasons, I find. Um, and I just don't think with uh, the, the technologies out there anymore that it's even worth hiding that stuff, even if you're not you know, committed to transparency. My two cents. Yeah, sure. So, an example. Right now we plan a backpack with Puma. And uh, when we will implement information in this backpack, uh, the, the first information is very simple. It's called, uh, the information is, please, Ico, cut the backpack in five centimeter pieces and send it to a company in China, for example, this company will use these five centimeters cut pieces to a new product. That's all, basically. But in the future, in the future, I think we have to talk about completely new dimensions. When we found, when we will find out uh, new possibilities, good for the planet, why we don't want to share it? That's a, a basic question we have to answer in the future for us all. And I can tell you all the big and global player in, in the retailer like H&M, Puma, or Adidas, okay, they want to be the first mover. Secret to the point when the, a new shoe comes out. But afterwards, they are thinking about and they are very open to change their mind to say, okay, we, from this point, when we are the first mover, that's okay, and then we will share. I think in this area we have um, we have a, a lot of work in our mind to change our thinking, to change our uh, being good for the planet. Yeah, I want to give you a little story. So, uh, William McDonald, I have been doing a, a fabric for upholstery, uh, where we, where traditionally when you make such a chair or a, a 
so far, etc. The pieces you cut off are so toxic that they need to go into hazardous waste incineration. And if that cannot be the case, you sit on the sofa, you are nervous, it actually eat up your sofa, it gets consumed, it gets the brain, it gets up, it, it, you basically take it up. And so it, it, it needs to be designed that you could eat it actually. So we chose the chemical because and that's why it's so insisting on, on the Huntsman situation that you understand it. Huntsman bought most of the Siba uh, Gagi company from Switzerland. And and we choose all the chemicals that you can eat them. Yeah, and they are now present in in most of the airline seeds, etc. But in the formula for this, what is in these uh, textiles was uh, stolen by another competing company in the United States. Uh, was not stolen, they bribed the Sibagagi people with $200,000 to get the access to the information. <laughs> yeah, but then they had the formula. And so should they communicate design to the stolen formula of chemicals? They couldn't make any claims you know, about it. So <laughs> they could use it, but they couldn't make any claims about it. And the certification will help because then you can protect intellectual property what you did because it's a certified product and registered in that. It makes it easier for that. On the other side, uh, the first thing is we want that companies take their stuff back. And that's the most important thing that they actually, right now, if the profit is completely privatized and the risk is completely socialized. This is a strange form of socialism. And we want that the ones who have the profit have the risk as well. And that's the main purpose is that the ones who make the stuff get it back. So if that chip says, hey, if you, if you steal your fake product, you take it back, you know, it would be a first step. Definitely to, to close loops, but you need to decide it for that purpose. And sure, this ecological rucksack, it will be the first ecological rucksack made with one mono material. And one mono material out of just one material, which endlessly can go back to the same system. And it only says this is one mono material to go back endlessly to the same system. That was what the chip basically says. It doesn't say what it actually is, it says, hey, we want to have it back, and here is the place where it should go back in the same product endlessly. Because it's made out of nylon 6, and you can make it back into nylon 6, and nylon 6, and nylon 6 forever. You will read it here, read it down tomorrow about the carpet site. Maybe, Stefan, you can say a little bit about the carpet collection as well. Is it still going on here in California? Yeah, in the US. Yeah. Yes. CEO of Soex Group in the USA, as well as ICO. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Quickly, uh, what we do in uh, what we do in uh, Fresno, we collect used carpets and we shave it and uh, we turn it into fiber, and we ship the fiber to companies who make them into pellets, and these pellets then get turned into any kind of plastic product. Of course, the problem with the uh, uh, carpet is the, uh, the leftover 75%, which is uh, really a terrible product because it put into landfills. <coughs> now we're trying to work with some companies who use it as energy. And uh, it's not a perfect solution, but nevertheless, it's better than throwing the whole thing away. So yeah. that's what we're doing first now. Yeah, we, we see that in most of the countries, these go to landfills. Yeah, definitely. And there is a step in the right direction, but we'll see tomorrow uh, with, uh, with Desso's uh, presentation uh, how the design can make a difference for the 75% as well, which right. we make right now. Yeah, right. Definitely, but to collect it and take it out of landfills, it makes a lot of sense as well. The carpet is really the, one of the most difficult things to handle because of the way it, it, it performs itself in, in, a, in a landfill. You know, it's uh, what you shave. It's perfect, but we can't we can't do much with the seventy five percent. And yeah. so that's, that's why design. That's why California's center for design is so key, 
to look for cradle to cradle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Helen Marsh. I work for Conservation International in their Center for Environmental Leadership in Business. And uh, my question is really to directed towards Method and Aveda, and but particularly Aveda because you have uh, retail outlets, and it really is following up from um, your comment related to um, taking back the, you know, the the end product that you out in the world. So in the case of, you know, if, you, if both of you would be the containers that your products are, are bottled or, or contained in. And um, have you considered a system which is similar to IHO, where the consumer brings in their empty containers and receives some sort of reward system? We've, we've approached that in two ways. And uh, one is the recycled caps with the beta particularly directed to um, Aveda packaging, but it was a, a program that we initiated to capture polypropylene caps, particularly that were uh, getting into the environment. And this program has been going on now for three or four years. And while it's not a huge program, it's been very successful in the sense that we've been able to recapture about a million pounds, I believe, of polypropylene and we've actually turned that into caps for our packaging um, you know fully 100% recycled polypropylene uh, the, the bigger part of your question that you're probing for is of course a huge one for consumer products companies which is the, the whole issue of manufacturers responsibility or however we want to phrase it uh, extended producer responsibility. Uh, we are actually conducting an experiment in one of our sales regions in the United States to see how that works on a, on a voluntary basis. And we're doing it in the Rocky Mountains. We've, we're about a year and a half into it. Um, you know, we're trying to understand the costs involved. We're trying to understand the efficiency of capture. You know, how do you actually get people to bring materials back? And also the uh, you know the ultimate end use of the materials, how they can be reused, and and the most successful part of this experiment to date has been the uh, material reuse part of it, because we're partnering partnering with a company in Indiana that repurposes materials, and they've been able to find uses, not necessarily upcycling, but at least recycling, reuse for about 98% of the materials collected. So, um, you know, we're in an experimental phase. We certainly have not made a commitment to do this, but we understand the problem. Uh, we understand the magnitude of the materials that we put into the marketplace that are not recap, that are not recycled, even though we have tried very hard to drive the market for recycled materials to the point where about 55 to 60 percent of all of our packaging materials are post-consumer recycled content. So that's where we are. We're looking at it, but we're nowhere Be near there. Before Adam is answering that, just in, in, in Avila, maybe there's a lot of understatement about these things, uh, because, because uh, they really did something in the packaging field which is relevant for the whole world. Uh, there is a company in, in North Carolina in Vision Plastic, and they're the only company in the world which has the permission for food uh, contact of post-consumer polypropylene. The only one. There's no other in the world here. Yeah. So the post-consumer polypropylene yeah, was only initiated by Aveda, and they could, could get enough material together because Aveda guaranteed the price and to take the material. Yeah, to take some material from that. 100% post-consumer. But the amazing thing is, and that's really interesting, look, Americans have about five times more one-way products in Europe, in Europeans. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons, therefore, is this, uh, this hidden, uh, suppressed sexual uh, <laughs> sex. Because Americans cannot touch something which has been touched by somebody else before. Yeah. It, it's really amazing. Yeah, you, you talk, it, 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 Adam was making 
benefit uh, yet because we talked about it, campaign about it. Uh, the amazing thing is, uh, I was at Ben and Sherry's, for example, and they reintroduced styrofoam cups in their canteen yeah, because people are so afraid to get to touch something which has been touched by somebody else before, and they could get an infection from a porcelain cup. Yeah. So they, they reintroduce styrofoam cups. And, and you can see this, Americans, we talk about polymer raw materials, secondary raw materials, yeah. and Americans talk about virgin materials. Yeah. And without giving you details, yeah, you cannot recycle the virgin. Yeah. So because it's made of females, yeah, but it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. So, so in that case, the amazing story behind that, yeah, sorry, I'm pretty long for that, but the amazing story behind it, the post-consumer recycled polypropylene is much cleaner than the virgin polypropylene. Yeah. Because the recycling step washes out all the contamination from the primary production as well. Yeah. So it's basically for Americans, it's great, it's super virgin. Yeah. <laughs> so it's even better than virgin. Yeah. And that's amazing. And that's because of Aveda. Yeah. And they made basically the technology for the whole world out of this. You get really out of post consumer stuff, much, much cleaner materials. And secondly, they, they collect the caps. The main reason was we have a biologist in our institute, and she has been cutting uh, of look for seabirds. Uh, what is the main reason that they die of plastic? And these are caps, because they look like scallops for these seabirds. Yeah. So they pick them up and take them up. And that's why that let's start with collecting caps that they don't go to the environment. And that's sensational. No other companies did a similar thing like that. And sure. The next step is to make little shredders in all the salons and to collect the stuff. If you can make it in shredders and get the stuff out of it, they are available. And sure, we want to convince, oh yeah, maybe you can write a little letter to Jack Bennett. Yeah, Jack Bennett is running the thing. Uh, and yeah, that we have little shredders in each salon for all the plastic packaging. And that people could bring us as well. It would have a little infrared marker that you would get the same red quality that you get directly from chips plastic chips, in which you then could ship and distribute, even together with agro distribution systems, it could work maybe. Yeah. So let's do so, and I think Messi would try that as well as Matt. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I wanted to say a couple of things about this. Method's a huge, uh, we're a huge fan of EPR, uh, of Extended Producer Responsibility, and, and Take Back programs. Uh, I, but I, 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 there's not a one-size-fits-all solution for different types of products, and I think this is really important. Um, first of all, there's a couple of ways we address this problem. Design for recyclability, as these guys do, not making anything that couldn't go through curbside recycling, number one. Number two, and this is really big for our business, is refills, getting people to, instead of buying another new one of these, to have a refill that, you know, the reuse the trigger in the bottle, and that substantially reduces um, some of that impact. But even, even beyond that, we started, we looked actually several years ago, uh, I worked with Ken Alston at NBA, who was working with the U.S. Postal Service, who's done a lot of work in cradle to cradle. We're looking at, well, you know, why can't we put a postal stamp on the back of this thing and when somebody's done with it, they just send us the bottom, right? I think that'd be, that works, right? The problem with that is we buy this product for $3. And the amount of plastic that we get back is maybe 10 cents worth of plastic, and it costs us even more money to recycle it, um, but, you know, to move it around to our recycling facilities. And no matter what we did, it was going to cost us a buck and a half to move that anymore. So there's no economic model for individual EPR as it relates to very low value items. There is for computers. Like you can pay somebody to bring a computer back to your store because you know, there's a lot of material value in that thing. And there's a lot more dollar margin in it. For low value items, I think it's, an, it's critical that we find an aggregating solution. Um, curbside recycling is one of those. It's obviously sort of broken system, um, but we've got to find ways of, of getting uh, aggregation at least at a local level so that we can get enough volume of you know, bottles together of things that aren't getting recycled. I mean, these usually are, but for other materials that aren't. So that um, when you send it somewhere to get recycled, that it's still economically viable. So I just, I think that that's um, really important. Um, the other thing I would emphasize is it's compounded by the fact that the higher the value of the item we've learned in our research, the more likely somebody is to actually bring it back to the store where they bought it. 
Um, we don't own our own retail stores where our stores are targets and grocery stores and things like that. So we can't even control that. But even if we did, people are much less likely to bring something back like a bag of potato chips um, than they are something that they paid a lot more for. Um, and that's just sort of a weird consumer thing that also points to the solution. If you need a solution at home where those people can, uh, can aggregate that solution. Yes, sir, but what you need is you need smart chemistry in that if you add an infrared marker and you can separate it out of even out of different material streams to separate it and you can separate it more than 500 pieces per second actually yeah, in a separation line mechanically by, in, by inf near infrared which is just blowing out a different different plastic material and then you can use it standardized and you can add the additives in that but as well a, we need to reinvent uh, complex products like yeah, in, in the Puma shoes we will connect the top and the button with a reversible glue. When you heat it to a certain temperature it falls apart and you can really do something. And for a Puma shoe the materials are as expensive as the labor cost so it really makes sense to get the material back and to use it in that sense by what Adam said. And so for I call it a different thing because it's really worth something. This uh, food transportation packaging definitely is something in that. Other questions? Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, Hi, I'm uh, Gail Lloyd Daddy Allo of Bonner And uh, my question to uh, the, the panel, looking for input from various sources, um, it seems like uh, your organizations have uh, embraced this innovative uh, culture. And uh, I guess Adam, you're a founder, I think I heard you say. And so you've been able to foster that from the inception of the organization. Um, and Chuck, you've been with the organization after it uh, started. Both organizations, I, I would say, are growing. How do you continue to foster that innovative thinking in conjunction with the cradle to cradle concept? within your organizations as they get bigger and it requires more um, time, time in it, uh, to, to do that. Uh, to speak real quickly, I do think that a lot of the cradle to cradle innovation starts at the top, really, and like the CEO on both ends, Stefan, Adam, seeing the way, seeing the path forward. A lot of the cradle to cradle companies have incredible CEOs and then just goes from top to bottom. Desso, Rudy is here and his company is the same way. And um, Bondra Monday, you know, you saw, you heard the CEO completely engaged. It really takes that um, leadership and cradle to cradle just becomes embedded in the whole company. And that is transformative. We just need a lot more leaders like that. And we know them, we know they're out there. We just need to give them a path. So I think these are really great examples. We'll hear some more tomorrow. So maybe you would like to have collect, say, something to from her perspective on communication, marketing, internally in companies and outside posts. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I, I actually have questions maybe you think, more than yeah, answers. You think, maybe introduce yourself a little more because you did some great work. <laughs> um, but on the hot seat here, I came here prepared to listen, not to speak. So um, my company is Big Imagination Group, and we're celebrating our 25th year this year. Um, most of our clients are in the LOHA space. It's an acronym for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability, if you don't know it. Um, we launched the Prius for Toyota back in 2003, I think it was, um, because it was alternative transportation was a passion of mine. Um, I bought a small fleet of Priuses in 2002, Pri in 2002, when it was this ugly little car that Toyota couldn't even give away. Um, so I bought a small fleet, um, uh, created a campaign around it, um, got some notice, People Magazine, LA Times, etc. Did, did some stories on what we were doing, and Toyota came and knocking and they said, how are you getting all this press on a car that we can't even give away? <laughs> and of course, to which I responded, hire me and we'll do the same for you. <laughs> it wasn't that easy, because Sachi's been their agency for a hundred years. Um, but we came up with an idea at the beginning of 2003 to get to invite celebrities.
to take the Toyota Prius to the Academy Awards and provide chauffeur-driven Priuses. And of course, Toyota said that's an amazing idea, but you're never going to do it because it's, a, it's, it's tradition to take these black limousines. Of course, that's all I needed to hear. Um, we didn't know anybody in Hollywood at the time, and through a friend of a friend, I got Susan Sarandon's um, assistant's email, pitched him. He loved the idea. He ran it by her. He called the next day and said, she's in. And with Susan Sarandon, we got Tim Robbins, and we got 10 celebrities that first year. I called Toyota back and said, well, we've got 10 celebrities. The Oscars are two weeks away. Will you give me cars? And they said, uh, yeah. So that's how that started. And it was, again, um, um, really understanding the culture from an outside in perspective. Toyota couldn't beat its chest on an environmental platform because, quite frankly, nobody cared. Um, and, and from a consumer perspective, people have different motivators. It could be eco-consciousness. It could be economics. It could be health. So, but because we are, we do live in a celebrity-obsessed culture, we had people like Cameron Diaz and Leo DiCaprio who actually walked the walk, um, just drive these cars to the Academy Awards or take these chauffeur-driven vehicles to the Academy Awards where it wasn't done before, ever. And people took notice and they said, what is that? which of course then big the question. So um, it, it, it's something that actually got the ball rolling for Toyota and then brought the conversation about alternative fuel vehicles to the forefront and that it's not difficult and that it's really easy to do. So ease was really important. But I guess my question to the panel and I guess um, to um, um, Cradle to Cradle, um, what is the consumer awareness as it, as it relates to cradle to cradle? And from a manufacturing standpoint, how do you leverage that association or that commitment to C2C practices as a brand differentiator? Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll take it back to the my presentation and the slide where I can depicted the abated culture. And that's really the brand culture, where the mission is the focus of it, the, the quality and efficacy of the products is the main message. But in part, you know, part of the brand equity equation is the earth friendliness dimension of it. So if you can weave the cradle to cradle messaging into that more general message that consumers value our brand for, then that's a way of communicating it at least. Whether we whether it in and of itself leverage leverages the products in the marketplace, we're not sure. But it is certainly part of the more holistic message. So and that's kind of the approach we've taken to it, partly because of the way the brand evolved from the outset. consumer perspective, I mean, I can see Cradle to Cradle as the new good housekeeping seal that, that consumers look for, and it becomes almost a, um, a seal of approval, if you will. Education has to be put in place, and I guess manufacturers are part of that education process, baked into what you're already doing. Um, but it, it, I think there's amazing potential. I would like to add something at this point to figure out. If the first thing is cradle to cradle, first is a quality set, holistic quality. And do you really need to know how your airbag works in a car? You want to have a safe car. So it will be just a, a, a symbol for, and for a safe and healthy and good product. A product which becomes waste has a quality problem. Like a product which is connected to child labor has a quality problem. So let's talk about quality and beauty. That's why it, it is first. So a, the real compelling thing first is in the companies, the, the absentee rate goes down because before a, people were just making stuff which ends in a landfill. Now they are part of a, of a program to really to close cycles and that makes them proud and it takes their families to the company and it's really amazing how it helps with the profitability. The second thing as well is that 
it's a, when people want to do great quality stuff, they come up with different communication systems. Like we did, for example, for Daimler, Daimler you know, this company making trucks, yeah? and they cannot go into markets like Mexico easily or like Bulgaria, Romania, because of the, the, the trucks are relatively expensive. So when we propose to them charterways, charterways means that they are selling trucks only for seven years as a service. In, so they sell them for seven years to use them in Germany, in France, and, and you know, in Netherlands. And then they go back and people pay it for the, the material, it for, for, the, for the status of the, the quality, which is how they get the car and the truck back. Now they can get, get refurbished and go into Romania at a much, much lower price because they high quality as a Mercedes, yeah, which it allows them access to markets which they never had before. Yeah, and it's amazingly profitable. Or we did the rent a solvent concept, for example, as a cradle to cradle thing. So if maybe you're a little too much focused on the consumer product side, it means now we don't need to use the cheapest solvent anymore. You are not interested to get it evaporated because you pay for the use of the solvent you know, in, in the industry for decreasing. And now you can make stuff where you don't put other unnecessary stuff in it to get waste because you're just telling the use of the solvent and you pay for every kilogram which is missing. So there's no interest in release in lose, losing the solvent before you're interested to get it evaporated because then you don't need to pay for getting rid of it. Now you pay per kilogram which is missing. So you just sell the use of the, of the solvent and it allows to make far, far better solvents which don't generate occupational health problems. So it's a service situation, like I showed with a TV set. Yeah, we will need different, and that's why I wanted to have you on the panel, different communication and marketing systems as well. Like Adam shows it here, yeah, really making communities, forming communities around values, where because because it's important that people can form a community and and they can express their their values in buying a product as well. Like you illustrated with Arena in the same way, and sure. As well, if you bring your textiles back or your shoes back, you get your customer back. If you look at a company like Adidas, Adidas pays twice as much money to get a customer back than making a shoe. So it's twice as expensive. This is stupid. They never can pay a fair price salary for the people in Vietnam as long as they have a communication system, which is just silly, because they only can get their customer back right now when the shoe becomes ugly. So you first need to insult your customer, then you bring it back. You know, that's not a real smart system. It's like you can try it out with your husband. So if you, 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 you knock him down, and then they don't please come back. You know, that doesn't make sense. You're insulting your customer, and then you, and, the, and that's why you need to have all these sports people, these celebrity sports people, you know, which you basically bribe your customer and say, oh, you belong to a greater community because there is this famous yeah, uh, uh, basketball player with you as well. This is completely sick yeah, because it, it makes more sense to sell in, uh, just in insurance. Yeah. So we will have shoes yeah, with Puma which only which have an expiration date, yeah, which just say best before 2015. Yeah. And they will be nice and intact shoes where we actually plan that they can be used by somebody else. You want to be in my shoes and that. But you get your customer back. We will have a deposit on it, and sure, the ICO will help because then you can decide about it even with what you want to do with your your premium shoes which you got brought back. It's a community building thing. It just makes sense. Why should you first wait until the shoe becomes ugly before you see your customer back? You, you can use the materials again, again for all different types of great products. So we need to reinvent communication and marketing around it, and that's why I'm so glad to see Arena. And, and Adam, you here, because it's about new ways of connecting to the customer. The, customer. The, the one other quick comment I'll make on the consumer angle is just the distinction, I think, with, between like a, good, like a good housekeeping seal and that. And, um, I think what we're talking about here, um, the, the cradle to cradle is not static, right? So um, as you create customer relationships, like Michael was talking about, you're, you're creating an ongoing relationship with that customer. and the philosophy is about um, continually improving that product over time in its total quality. 
environment and social is a part of that. And so for us, that's really important, right? Because we have fairly, uh, they're fairly frequent use of problems. Um, so we want people to kind of join the movement, the join People Against Dirty, and then subscribe to kind of all of the stuff that we do. And then that's also what allows us to then come out with the next most innovative thing, because we've got an installed base of people that are willing to try something kind of wacky, like you know a laundry detergent that just did. So I think that's that's important too. Maybe it's as well, uh, Prince, you can say a little bit why the Dutch uh, postal lottery is supporting this institute here as well, because sure. that's the um, biggest contribution, financial contribution, I know, it, is by the Dutch postal lottery. Dutch postcode lottery yeah. just gave us the most incredible grant, and we wrote it for the global scaling of the certification. Mm. And we got a grant for 2 million euros, mm. which, thanks to the strength of the euro, that was a lot of money. We <laughs> 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 were hoping that Obama wouldn't do anything really important. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I think the thinking, and I, I kind of see the certification as the intel inside. Mm -hmm. and. We don't have enough consumer-facing products. We honestly, I mean, if you went around with your little good guy thing trying to find a score on a cradle cradle product, it just wouldn't get you there. But um, tomorrow, uh, Rudy will talk a lot about the marketing they've done. They've really stepped out with the certification. On the other hand, I see credit credit certification as sort of the intel inside when it comes to method. Same thing on iCollect, it's the intel inside. I mean, they're not promoting credit credit certification, but they're a very important part of the technical nutrient cycle, getting stuff back getting placed in things where they can be reused. And I think that's, those are just really important stories. And um, I, I'm looking forward to marketing ideas from everybody. I you know, think there's a, some killer ideas out there that people have already shared with me. I'd love to hear more of them. I'd like to see a lot more consumer-facing products get certification because I think they have good stories to tell because the product will become incredible and the story that their companies can tell will become fabulous. And I think there's just a wonderful opportunity for any company that would come to me and say, credit credit or certification is the way I'm gonna go. So we're looking forward to that. I'm, I was just gonna add, um, Adam, to your point, it, it, from a brand differentiator standpoint, it really is about these relationships that you build vis-a-vis -vis what your commitment is. And while this may sound a little woo-woo, I mean, it's, it's emotional. It's about love. It's about love of yourself, your family, the planet, and really um, profoundly living. And not in a way where you're just, you know, it, it, every you're just disregarding everything else. So I think it's it kind of boils down to that. Yeah, so from, from our point of view right now, so we, we, we can talk about Numbers, numbers. We can we can see every day in every uh, region, yeah, to the single store how, how much we collect every day. And uh, when we have a campaign, for example, be good for the planet. Come on and be good for the planet. Come in. Sorry, nobody will come. Yeah. And when when someone uh, when we, when we say love you love the planet, come when you love. Okay, nobody will come. But the, the, greatest, the greatest success we ever had was in Austria with Intimissimi. They said, okay, come bring us in your bra. You can have $5 for one bra and you can use the $5 voucher one, one for one. So when you bring back five bras, you have $25 uh, and you can have a new one. Yeah. That was the, the most successful action. So at the moment what I will say is the key point at the moment is just profit, just money. This econo economic made motivated, motivated, thank you. And uh, I hope in the future we we'll change a little bit. Yeah? And, and with every visit from a, from a consumer only for money, they will, they will, they will um, get the information about the environment and to good for the planet uh, automatically. Yeah. So long term, I, I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of things will change in the in the mind of the consumer. They come today only for money. Tomorrow they will come for more. But but Stefan, it, 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 it's going to be true. Yeah. Because what you see, what is collected.